Welcome one and all to Umami Manga. I'm Petter and this is James. Hello. And today we're talking about volume 5 of Asadora. We're back and who boy, I'm excited to talk about this one. Uh, <laughs> Asa and Yone and Miyako in this volume all kind of had their own simultaneous struggles that they kind of went through uh, on mm. different fronts in this book. And in a way, just kind of spontaneous thought about the volume as a whole I kind of felt like this was sort of a climax or the end of a story arc in a in a way yeah sort of because we got so many things kind of resolved and some Mm -hmm. answers uh, or some questions answered so it felt like a like a neat little resolution and obviously in the middle of a bigger story but yeah it was it was a very nice volume in that way for sure you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there is a time skip in the next volume. Uh, I, I know in the previous discussion I've said, oh, when is this time skip? But this volume does kind of make it feel like we're going to have some sort of conclusion to this current arc, which we which we've experienced at least two arcs have been in a time frame. Well, one arc it was when she was younger, and then this mm. arc is when she's in middle or uh, high school. So, uh, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if we have some sort of time skip eventually in the next volume. I think a, a bit of Asa stuff has to be resolved first. Yeah. Uh, like, they have to they have to come to conclusions on things. But I think with Yone and Miyako, it, it's, it feels like we may even just see where their life is heading instead of uh, having more of their high school days. Yeah. I could definitely see that happening. But I could also see potentially another arc in a way just set in the same Mm. age uh yeah i mean i can see that as well you're right i mean i guess i'm really going off only going off of what we've experienced right which is only it's it's just a little pool to to uh take from that i I probably shouldn't be jumping to conclusions like that but anyway I I, i agree with you that there is a bit of conclusion in this volume to a, a few of the plot points. Yeah, so that was very nice. So, but yeah, I, we will talk about those as we get through the characters here. So without further ado, let's talk about Asa Asada. I believe you and I both didn't expect Asa to uh, to fire the rockets in this encounter when we talked about it last volume. Yeah. I, <laughs> but she did. I guess I was expecting her to save them from a rainy day or you know they were just there and then they would actually be used at a later point right but no no like he's, he's i'm i introduced these i'm gonna use them <laughs> hell yeah and i mean i i understand it given like the serious the very serious situation mm-hmm. and how she really wanted to do everything that she could in order to stop the kaiju from making landfall like right never give up and that whole mentality. It made sense considering, and, and like as she said, she didn't want anyone else to get taken from by, by the kaiju or died to the kaiju like her family did. That was beautiful, I thought. I, I thought it was interesting how she practiced before firing the missiles instead of just firing them right away. Mm. I mean, it still is kind of incredible that she was able to do that, even the practice at all. But she's very gifted. Uh, we've established that, so I, I guess it makes sense that uh, she could learn, teach herself to do that. Um, and I'm glad it wasn't just, like I said, right off the bat, she fires the missiles perfectly. Oh, I've never done this before, but I can do it. <laughs> right, right. She she told herself that she, she had to practice, so mm-hmm. th- it kind of made it a little more believable. I think so, yeah. Plus, it also kind of made me at least recall like her fl- landing practice, like the first time she flew, how she... True practice that once before actually landing for real so i thought that was nice that's a good point and and also kind of from back then or since back then i believe she keeps a plastic bag and string and balloons in her overalls (laughs) as well as a helium tank in the plane and i thought that was just so touching because she it means that she's always kind of prepared for a crisis like this and that she wants to be able to help out in whatever way she can in case something like that should happen again or something like that I, I really like that little touch. Mm, I, I don't know if I call it touching. For me, I thought it was ingenious or uh, intuitive. It just, just smart planning on her part. 
Right. I mean, how are you supposed to predict that you're going to have to drop gasoline on on a giant monster? But I, I think it's more so that she's prepared for a, a situation or any situation to occur. Mm. Um, and she knew how useful those were. But yeah, so no, I think it's it's it, it was like you said, cool to see it connect to her first time flying. Yeah, and even how like this time she was the one flying the plane and giving instructions as to how to blow up the balloons and when to drop the bags and stuff like <laughs> true last time it was Kasuga who, who did all of that but now it was her and I think well in a way I, I, I like how the story rhymes here with volume one but also yeah how it shows Asa's growth I think that's really nice for sure uh, w- one thing that this volume showed and forgive me if I'm if I'm going too far ahead but I, I think this was for me it was pretty important for Asa's character is the fact that she flew out into the darkness, you know, leading the monster away mm-hmm. after they did all they could. Uh, but then she flew out of the darkness and it kind of had a moment where she, she w- was panicking a little bit. Yeah. And that's kind of a sign of weakness we really haven't seen from Asa too much. I mean, yes, we've, she's had moments when she was little where she, she was crying or you know, sad or something like that. But ever since she learned how to fly, it, or around that time, it I, I have expressed my kind of annoyance that she just does everything incredibly well. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> like there's no there's no uh, step back. Like she mm. just does it, and it works out. But this time we act, there is there was actually something that yes. she wasn't prepared for. That unless someone helped her, she she couldn't do it by herself. Exactly. Yeah, she was completely helpless there for for a right. time, in that nightmare, really. Yeah. Like that that scenario, like being being stuck in a flying machine, not knowing where you are or how you're positioned, like that. That's ter- that's got to be terrifying. Yeah, I imagine it's, it must be similar to being in space. <laughs> in right. Way. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that complete darkness, and I'm not saying that she should be helpless. Uh, what I am saying, it's human to be helpless. Yeah, right. Uh, there are moments where all of us have, have times where, you know, when we're in a situation we're not aware of, we may be able to get out of it somehow, but a fair amount of us are going to have moments of weakness. And, mm-hmm. and I think it's, it's more human and more relatable to see that. So I was happy to see that and obviously relieved when Casca came to her, her aid, you know? I thought it was great. Definitely, yeah, and I, I agree. I thought it was a really nice change of pace to, to show this helpless side to her, which I yeah, as you said, we hadn't seen too much before. Right. But I I also like how she referenced Kasuga and um, maybe even acknowledged her own growth that she needs to go through in order to become the pilot like he is. Yeah, and and like while it was sad also to see kind of how she was kind of down on herself afterward. Yeah, like, that was you know, sad. Mm-hmm. That, that was definitely sad. But it also, it, it, it's a new side of her. Wait, oh my mm-hmm. God. I, I don't know if this is, if, if you can hear this, but my cat is I having heard the, something. The, the, the zoomies right now. She's running <laughs> around like a, like a madman. Like, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, where was I? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, 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 yeah, how she was done herself. That, that is very sad to see. But I still kind of appreciated that we got to see something like that from her because we haven't really seen too much of that, uh, especially in this age, kind of. Yeah. But, you know, mission accomplished. They were able to get a good look at the monster. Well, a good enough look at the monster. Yeah. They were able to get it away from land. Uh, Close call, but they did it. And then she Mm -hmm. was able to land eventually safe and sound. Right, yeah. I mean, yeah, like, pulling away or, like, using herself as bait the way she did, like, it was incredibly reckless, but also incredibly heroic. Like, she saved, yeah. or potentially in any way, I mean, we don't know for sure, but she potentially saved a bunch of people mm-hmm. by doing that. That's amazing. And one of my favorite little moments during that whole encounter was um, when Asa threw the signal flare at the at the monster, and she was singing her song... And right. I thought that the words, the words, because I love you, that she was singing in the moment, they were especially impactful in that moment because in that instance, it's, it's, it's like she's singing it like for her lost family and like how she loves them. 
And I thought that was beautiful. I thought it was an interesting parallel because as she was singing, so was Yone. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. That's too. <laughs> singing very different songs uh, in very different situations, but both <laughs> singing in some way. Both right, taking the stage. Yeah. <laughs> we just needed Miyako to sing something as well on her end. <laughs> <laughs> um, something that happened here with her encounter the monster, she heard it when it uh, finally felt the fire. She heard it screaming. Yeah. And it re- reminded her of when she was younger. And I guess we already already assumed that she had actually heard a monster, I think. We had already come to that conclusion. But this kind of confirms that for her that that was indeed what she heard and that and it wasn't just the wind, you know? Yeah, definitely. I, I still don't know if that means too much other than she knew something was out there. Yeah, I wonder, well, actually, now, just, just because you brought it up now, it got me thinking about it a little extra, and it got me thinking that, so, when she heard that cry in this volume, it was when the kaiju was in pain. Mm-hmm. Might that suggest that when she heard it the first time, back in 59, that it was also in pain in that moment, even mm-hmm. though, obviously, back then, we didn't, we don't know exactly the circumstances or anything, but maybe it was, mm-hmm. maybe it attacked back then because it was in pain somehow for some reason Mm, maybe at the very least it it probably doesn't mean that she has a special connection to the thing right (laughs) probably not probably not (laughs) and well since we're talking about asa and some of the things i guess surrounding her i i feel like we got to talk about what we learn in this volume about her names meaning in portuguese ah first of all it was really nice to finally understand kind of more about that scene from the jungle yeah he was setting that up like you know (laughs) i i had no idea it'd be portuguese (laughs) yeah like we had no no clue like but yeah that that was really interesting how and now now we now we know that asa means wing in portuguese Mm -hmm. and the full sentence that the man in the jungle spoke in English, translates to a goddess with golden wings will save us, uh, followed by the word sarava. And I apologize for my pronunciation. I don't know Portuguese or any language that's particularly close to Portuguese. Um, but I have a Brazilian friend who I consulted about oh. about all of this, actually, <laughs> wow. who helped me a little bit. Um, because, well, well yeah, the, the book itself even translates like the main portion of that sentence for us, saying that, wow. yeah. A goddess with golden wings will save us. But then there, there's that, that word that, he's, that he says at the end of the sentence, Sarava, which according to my Brazilian friends is an interjection that is sort of a... Amen? A chanting salutation, kind of. Hmm. Uh, and actually, well, the, the your amen guess might not be totally inaccurate uh, hmm. because it, it, it's, it's kind of like a hooray but obviously not mm. quite that, but like it's comparable to that. However, it does have more of a religious intonation kind of to it. What if it's like hoorah? Like, like a hoorah or a, or a amen combination, maybe. Mm. I, I don't know exactly, but it, it's, it's something along those lines at the very least. Anyway, not only is it cool to know that Asa means wing, but there's also like part of the sentence when he said asa de oro which means golden wings my brazilian friend said that that phrase asa de oro can also be said like asa dorada <laughs> which well yeah it means golden wings and obviously sounds very close to the title of the manga asa dora yeah so i think Dang. it's just so cool how there's multiple meanings to obviously in japanese it means morning drama but in Portuguese, it basically kind of means golden wings at the same time. So I, I love that. I love it, too. I think it gives the the name of the manga a much better theming. or you know, mm-hmm. it, it fits the manga so much better, I think. Yes. Not to say that morning drama isn't what this is, but I, I feel like knowing that it's golden wing, it kind of plays along with the plane flying and everything. So, yeah, it's great. Yeah, I love it. So thank you, my good friend. I, I don't want to like out, out your name necessarily, but thank, th- <laughs> thank you, my Brazilian friend, <laughs> for uh, for helping me out with this. 
you know, there's a lot of uh, Japanese immigrants in Sao Paulo, I believe. I think it's like the first, second, first most mm -hmm. uh, population of Japanese people outside of Japan. Oh, interesting. Huh. Yeah. Cool. So maybe, I don't know, maybe Naoki Ur Urasawa got some inspiration that way. Who knows? Anyway. Right. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> Another question about this. I don't know if you can answer this or not. Mm -hmm. Does this prayer or chant come from anywhere or is this an original Naoki work um, or Urasawa work, I should say? Like the whole, like the whole thing that he said. Um, I don't know, actually. I have no idea. Mm. Although my, my my Brazilian friend did say that the word "sarava," like that exclamation that he used at the end of the sentence, mm -hmm. according to at least as far as he knew, is more of a specifically Brazilian thing, mm. as opposed to other parts of the world where they speak Portuguese. So for mm. it to be used in Timor, where that jungle was may mm. not be accurate although obviously he, he doesn't he didn't he also said that he he doesn't know for sure maybe it also it also is used kind of in that way there but uh it seemed like it was mostly like typically in brazil that it was used that way so the reason why i ask is because if it is something that he's heard before or you know there's actually out there then it maybe doesn't have as much meaning but if it is something that he created is there a reason why this people has this has a saying other than it's just in, within their mythology? You know, it, is there a reason for the golden wings or, or, or Oh yeah. That probably would change the theme of the story or or the genre of the story, but I don't know. It could be very interesting if Asa was something that these people predicted. <laughs> right. <laughs> Asa fighting against this monster. Huh, yeah. But I also wonder why did he why exactly did he shout that chant when he did or not shout but say that chant was it just to calm himself? Like yeah, like at, like for a, like a religious purpose maybe it felt he thought like it would help them, it would save them. Like a prayer perhaps. Mm. Sorry, just just things I wanted to bring up because I I don't know like it seems not not just the name drop is important but maybe there was more to it than just that but i could be wrong right i mean there may still be you know things that we don't know that may maybe will be revealed later like sure we got a bunch of new kind of insight into the scene but there may be more still but yeah next let's talk a bit about miyako oh miyako uh, okay <laughs> yeah so well the first thing and maybe the main thing that i wanted to bring up a about her, or at least related to her, was about that gang leader who said that that Miyako was just his type. He used a rather old-fashioned Japanese expression, transistor glamour, to describe her, uh, mm -hmm. which is a slang term that describes girls who are short but curvy. And for me, this was this, my second time coming across this term. Oh. Uh, so I thought it was, was kind of interesting. Uh, the first time... <laughs> Uh, that I ever came across that term was actually from Aka Akasaka, the mangaka of Kagesama Love is War, who oh. who used that term to describe Miko Ino. Oh. <laughs> he described her as transistor glamour on Twitter once. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, ah. So so I thought it was fun to 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 see that word in a different well, yeah, in a different way here. Is it literally transistor grammar? <laughs> like what? Uh, I I actually don't know. I I I like Twitter has this translation thing. Uh, uh. So I I don't know exactly, but I could see it being something like that. Because the the term, at least from my understanding, comes from how a transistor radio is like, or like back in the day when they were used, um, is like a smaller version of a regular radio, but still having all of the same assets, mm. if that makes sense. And applying that, this is sexualizing women, uh, but applying that to, to a woman who is smaller than average, but still having the same quote-unquote assets, if you know what I mean. Mm. So I believe that's the reason for the term. 
and it's not it's it's an outdated term though it's not particularly yeah, yeah. widely used anymore <laughs> which is probably a good thing to be fair if my if i looked this up correctly it seems transista gurama huh. doesn't really roll off the tongue in my opinion but it, yeah yeah it it took me a while to like kind of get used to the to the term <laughs> but either way mieko made friends with those uh fighters <laughs> who saved her i love i love that little unlikely meeting kind of and definitely hope to see them again ginko kongo what a hero she was mm mm-hmm. yeah uh, of all the things to happen that was probably the most unpredictable thing yeah right <laughs> for me i don't i don't think i would have predicted that in a, a thousand years <laughs> yeah. uh, but i but i appreciate the twist yes uh especially for miyako who out of them all seemed the most into being more of like an idol or something like that. Well, I mean, obviously Yone was into it, but she also really wanted to be, to do something like that. But now it seems like her interest may be elsewhere. Or at the very least, her story is not going down this idol path. Rather, she's maybe more interested in what's happening here. For some reason, I didn't think about that at all. But yeah, I, I like that I, I possibility. Could be wrong. I mean, I could be who knows? But I, I, I do still actually. I really like that idea of maybe Miyako becoming a fighter, <laughs> like, um, or at least starting to train or something like that. That mm-hmm. could be that could be really cool. Yeah. And I, and I guess it is also kind of it, 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 it's a funny contrast, kind of, since she she is kind of small, like her her, her build is kind of small. But mm. for her to become a fighter, potentially, it could be, could be pretty awesome. I agree. <laughs> I agree. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> Was that all on Miyako? Yeah. Then let us move on to Yone Nakajima. I thought she was, for, for, for a lot of the first part of her, of her part in the story, she was pretty mm-hmm. passive. Like, she, she, just kind of, she was just kind of swept along with whatever happened. Uh, yeah. Really, really for, for most of it, honestly. I, 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 yeah, most of it. Which I think makes sense because of her personality and kind of the situation that she was in. Right. Uh, you know, like, not only was she shy and uncomfortable, kind of, I believe, in the situation, but she was also trying to impress. And I believe when she was... or I, I think when one is trying to impress, it's easy to to become a little bit overly careful, kind of, and... Like, because you don't want to act up or mess up, and then you become just passive. Um, or I, th- I think it can easily happen to someone like her. Over- overly careful, I don't know about that one. Because someone who's careful would not have, would not have ended up going with them. You know? like, okay, well, careful, maybe not, okay, yeah. Not careful in that, in that specific way, but like careful in like not accidentally coming off strange or, or anything like that. I think you said it perfectly earlier. She just went with with the flow be kind of came fast passive let them yeah you know take her for a ride really which is not safe oh no but it turned out to be okay uh in in this situation but i agree like yeah she really wasn't taking control at all or really making her own decisions besides i guess going there but at the very end of it it did seem that she left the whole experience with a bit of determination and maybe a bit of confidence in yeah. what could she could become. Precisely. Yeah, she as she walked away from there, she took off her glasses for the first time like by her own volition. It would have been funny if she like landed flat uh, flat on her face because <laughs> she couldn't see. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no but I I think that yeah, that 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 definitely means I believe that she's about to embrace the entertainment industry kind of more actively from here on Mm. it was interesting because they have this marilyn monroe moment and then it goes to her walking away with confidence it's like what was the point of all that (laughs) like because i'm not even sure that she's going to keep in contact with the the scout guy or even uh esaku you know Uh, more probably more so him than the scout to be honest, I, well, it, I guess before talking about that, it, I did get the feeling the scout was trying to get a little frisky with her. Definitely. <laughs> right yeah. before Isaku came in. Um, yeah. So, 
I get, you know, good, good on us if we're sending him over. For sure. Although he, it did feel like he was kind of egging, it, egging the whole situation and, and I don't know, almost making it worse. But mm-hmm. at the very least, he saw potential in, in Yone and I think he embraced it. So I, I think it will be good for Yone in the end. Yeah, and I think I think she ultimately probably appreciated uh, Noro's intervention there, and like the way that he like he he didn't break off the audition or anything. In fact, he kind of took control of it, or like or like yeah, he he kept it going on his own terms, kind of. And I think she appreciated that because she wants to, or at least seemingly, she still wants to become an idol. And get into the industry. Oh yeah. Um, so sure. had if he had just called it all off and just dragged her away from there, I don't think she would have liked that as much as she liked the way that things turned out. You know. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't have blamed them for leaving because of the who they were dealing with that that talent guy, but uh, you know, he saw an opportunity and he and he took it. He saw potential. <laughs> Yeah, and, yeah, he did. Yeah, and I, I think it's good for Yoniko. Um, I have predictions about her, but I'll, I'll save that for an end of discussion. Sounds good. Then let's move on to Kinuyo next. She was totally seeing straight through Mr. Akira. Uh, I knew it. <laughs> yes, of course. And of course she would. <laughs> like, um. I, I think because just based on who she is and who he is, like it's mm-hmm. it's just made for a situation like that. Like, of course, she would yeah. see right mm-hmm. through him, and and she finally more or less gets in on uh, on what Asa has been doing and what she is doing. It's not super clear exactly if she understands everything and gets all the details, but at least right, she's not in the dark completely on all of this, which I'm very happy about. Yeah, you know, beginning to crack open this situation yeah i actually was interested when she was getting upset with the government and how they kind of just take away things from her Mm -hmm. and she begins to mention someone but stops uh, probably because it's very emotional for her and i don't know if you remember when we talked about uh why she was in oh gosh is it nagasaki no where Uh, nagoya or oh it was nagoya I mentioned like, oh, maybe she was waiting for someone, like a soldier or something like that. Uh, yeah. At the time, I, I I thought it would may have been a lover or something, but I I'm unsure. It could be a son. It could be just a. It could be a friend, a very important friend. Yeah. Um, but I I think lover's still an option as well. Uh, for sure, for sure. But it's somebody important to her, and I and I hope we get to learn more about that because I do think that would be very nice, or. Mm. I mean, sad, but good to get some closure and and understanding uh, of Kinyo. Exactly, because it's clearly still upsetting her. So yeah, I agree. It would be really nice to learn more about that, and maybe for her to somehow be able to process it and you know be able to maybe cope with it better, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, like most likely, it's a man. I uh, I feel like because I guess there are well mostly men in in war. So like it could be a father or or anything like like you said. Father, yes, that's possible. So there's a lot of options. But what what I thought was also really nice is how that scene really shows that Kinyo cares about Asa in a very similar way that she cared about that person who passed away. Absolutely. And and she doesn't want the same thing to happen to Asa. And I mean sure yeah, we we know very very well that she since before that she she cares about Asa deeply, but it was still nice to see kind of in this way, how much, how, how, yeah, how much she, she really cares for her. That's actually one of the reasons why I thought it could have been a son. Ah, uh, because oh yeah. of the way she cares for Asa and maybe how she uh, compares the two. Um, but right. it depends how old she is and, and stuff like that. So it, there's a few options. Yeah. But yes, I, for sure. I agree. It was nice to see how much, I, another, another sign of how much she cares for Asa. Yeah. It's beautiful. Well then, next, let's talk about Keichi Nakaido. <laughs> I, th- I thought it, it kind of was like he, he's like a true gamer ahead of his time when he was thinking that striking the, the things that look like eyes will, will harm the kaiju. 
I mean, that's it's, biology 101. You know, I, I guess it's also eyes biology. Eyes are the weakest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, but that got me giggling a little bit. I mean, look, you run into an unknown creature in the woods, poke its eye. You'll be safe. Yes. Don't do that. <laughs> Maybe not. Don't, don't poke a bear in the eye. <laughs> that's, that, that's a very bad idea. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, but he, he deciphered back fastener. Yeah, what in the world? Or at least he said that it could be read that way, he said. but I mean, the the back part is believable because I could kind of make out the Seinaka. Like, I could kind of make out the, the Japanese. Oh. And the English, uh, yeah, if you look at it, you could see faster. But it's like, faster? What is that supposed to mean? It, it, yeah, it sounds so nonsensical. It does. Like, <laughs> a fastener sounds like a tool or of some kind where... Hmm. You fasten a a metal object to something, or or hmm. or, or or some uh, something like when you're building a thing. So uh, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what the doctor was smoking when he was <laughs> writing down his notes. Uh, I'm not sure what Akaiwa, uh, what English class he was taking as he as he oh, was yeah. doing this. Why he suddenly <laughs> had the inspiration to write it in English. <laughs> but right if. Right. Is there a reason, a specific reason for that, maybe? The mind of a genius, you know. <laughs> we'll never know. Maybe not. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Keith, you got a little bit on the way on uh, deciphering, but yeah, there's a lot more to to do with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I don't believe there was any time for Kichi to draw a sketch of the kaiju while they were up in no. the in the air there. <laughs> they're gonna have to go off of memory if they're gonna draw one. Yeah. But yeah. interesting enough, the paper did pick it up, but one of the papers did, and we had talked about yeah. that. I think mm. uh, there was no there was no image, of course, and this is all eyewitness accounts. But going going back to the topic at hand, we've already talked about the winged goddess, so I don't want to go too much into that, but. Uh, the way Keiichi brought it up, is like, you're the weak god. It's like, well, slow down there, buddy. Like, it's like, don't go, don't go uh, throwing that term around to every lady you meet, okay? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, mean, I, I could also just see this as, you know, he, he just went through, like, a massive amount of stress. And maybe a bit of an adrenaline rush, you and, know? And, and, like, yeah, a bunch of adrenaline. <laughs> I think it makes sense for him to kind of act kind of hyper like that, if, uh-huh. if that makes sense. Um, I, I, I think it adds up. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at the very least, I don't think he's going to call her a nobody anymore. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. If he ever does that again, I will are... be mad. Oh, my gosh. I will be mad for real. <laughs> I was already mad at, at how many times he had been doing it. You <laughs> yeah. know? But it does... It, to me, it seems like he'll be much more uh, favorable towards her. Mm-hmm. Um, and I hope they have a great friendship that goes nowhere other than uh, friendship. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I can get behind that. <laughs> huh. Then next up, let's talk a bit about Eisaku Noro. Well, we already talked about him a little bit, but that timing when he arrived was pretty perfect because I believe he potentially saved Yone from something that could have been a bit nasty, perhaps. Yeah, that dress was not uh, not leaving much to the imagination. No, that's that's for sure. For sure, I was. Oh, I got the wrong. I, I actually do kind of believe he did get the wrong size, but I think it just kind of let him go a little too, get a little too wild, get a little too frisky. But definitely, um, yeah. No, no, Aesaku saves day. I was wondering what the Mon- uh, Marilyn Monroe thing was about, uh, and I still don't understand why they did. It other than, I mean, like. I actually kind of do understand. So, <laughs> because <laughs> I, I think what Urasa was trying to imply here is that Yone is going to be the next big idol, the next big thing hmm. since Marilyn Monroe. You know, the Jap- the Japanese version of Marilyn Monroe, uh, which mm-hmm. if you know who Marilyn Monroe was, um, yeah, obviously beloved person, but the the dark side of hollywood in a lot of ways 
Yes. Uh, so that could be interesting. I, I I guess I'm going in a bit of predictions there, but I, I but I think Asaka is kind of one of those people who would be the one to push for this. <laughs> uh, while he did yeah. save the day, you know, will he have the best interests in mind for Yone? Will he be the best influence for her? Uh-huh. Remains to be seen. I don't think that their relationship is going to end here, at the very least. No, no, definitely not. I just thought it was funny how easily the manager guy bought that Noro was like Yone's guardian. <laughs> like he just bought yeah. that act right <laughs> off the bat. Yeah, really. <laughs> um, and just went along with it. And like, and because of that, Noro got like so much influence in uh, like over the situation. Yeah. Even though it was like I don't know. It's pretty incredible that that it worked. <laughs> yeah, it, it didn't feel like it was. I, I, it's hard to put in the words. It, it it flowed, but it also went by so fast, like beat after beat after beat. In that, there wasn't much a, a time to argue with her with him being her guardian. You know, like mm-hmm. not even Yone said anything about it. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> It was maybe maybe a bit fast paced, but yeah. Anyway, but I guess I mean I I could see that maybe that was the kind of the point of it though, like cause it was just supposed to be this kind of spur of the moment kind of spontaneous plan kind of. I mean, these guys are in the entertainment industry, right? It's like bang, 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 mm. let's go. Yeah, right. <laughs> Next, let's talk a little bit about Mr. Beetle and maybe anything else real like surrounding him, just because. He had a little bit more of a role this time than in the previous volume. And, like, I, I, I don't know. I just thought he played his part at the lighthouse really well. And I thought he seemed like such a genuinely really good guy. Yeah. Um, how, yeah, like, he, he actually wanted to help Asa and did everything he could to do that. Unlike Jisoji, who, who <laughs> honestly seems to kind of just be getting colder and colder. But the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like screw the Olympics. Uh, no, but yeah. Um, I mean, at least Jisoji did allow Kasuga to go, like, take that plane and go save Asa. So that was good, at least. But, but yeah, I guess if there's anything on Jisoji, though, I don't have anything more on him. But no, no, I, uh, I don't know. I feel like we'll get Jisoji in next volume, though. Uh, yes, definitely hope so. Yeah. Then moving on to Haruo Kasuga. He's a real one, man. He's a real <laughs> yeah, one. he is. Yeah, I feel like the story has been like keeping him and Asa away from each other for a while. Uh, uh like quite qu- quite a while. So yeah. the moment when he you know, he arrived in the plane next to Asa's and they got to see each other like for the first time in quite a while, it felt so good. Like and yeah, for him to save her from the darkness. It was beautiful. When you say it like that, it seems very poetic. <laughs> yeah, it came off more poetic than I intended. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I agree. It's great that uh, we'll have them back together again. It, it's, it did seem that they hadn't seen each other in a while. Mm. But yeah, uh, I liked how he, I mean, I guess it's more a testament to his character, how willing or how much he obligated he felt to go take care of the man's mom. Yeah. And Kinyo makes an interesting point that the mother lost uh, her husband in the war while Kasaka lost his wife and child in the war. And so Kasaka, mm. I guess, feels uh, a bit of a sentiment or bond with that family and wanted to help in, in some way. So, uh, mm. man, it's just... I love... I, appearances are so deceiving. You would probably look at Kasuga, at least in, if you mm. just were showed a panel to someone, and they may not really see the kind-hearted, sentimental guy that he really is, but he, right. he is such a, a good guy. <sighs> he like, really, really is. Yeah. This is what a real man's like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a true warrior. A true warrior. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, but it, it, it's beautiful. And, like, I also imagine, like, that woman and 
and her son, or yeah, or like yeah, the guy that was was uh, hit by the car, like they are probably at least roughly around the ages that that Haruo's family would have been if they were still alive. I mm-hmm. I reckon like or at least around there. So that probably yeah even more kind of reminds him of of them. Do you think that uh, mother and son will still be in the story at all? Do you think Kasuga will bother to continue to take care of them? I mean, I could see him totally doing it. Yeah, right. I th- I did have that thought, but yeah, like, but no, but n- nothing really more than that. Just like, yeah, just, I yeah, just kind of wondering, yeah, if that could happen. They don't seem to be credibly important uh, to the plot. Mm. as characters uh, but i wonder if that could lead to maybe us getting to know more about kasuka's late wife and, and child right that would be that really could, nice I, mean, I think that'd be interesting i mean not mm. to dredge up old wounds but i always like to hear people's backstories and about yeah. the stories of their loved ones for sure and and yeah and with a character like like kasuga like we love him, so we want to know more about him, of course. Right, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. definitely. But next, let us talk about Shota Hayata. Okay. <laughs> he made an appearance, even though it was he brief. He did. <laughs> right at the end. <laughs> he did. He tends to do that. <laughs> yeah, he does. Um, yeah. Seems like his goals are shifted a little bit but he's he's still ready and excited to train and, and get to the olympics in mexico uh, exactly he is more determined than ever kind of it seems to yeah. to make it to that that next olympic games i like how the fellow paper person was cheering him on i, I kind of like that yeah that was sweet <laughs> i did not expect it to be honest i thought he would kind of maybe <laughs> tease hit tease hit shota about it but Seemed to be pretty supportive, so I like that. <laughs> that. Yeah, that was that was really nice. I also kind of expected the opposite for some reason. <laughs> yeah, it was really nice, especially since at the very start of that scene, we see him, or like yeah, we we see Shota kind of being reminded that today is the opening to the Olympics, and he's feeling kind of melancholic. And so mm. for him to ha- to get those words of encouragement by the end of of that brief little scene was very nice, and I think it was needed. I agree. <laughs> Just give me more of the man. I, <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I like his character so much that I just want to see more of him. Mm. Uh, but he is kind of, at this point, a little bit one-dimensional. <laughs> going to the Olympics, going to the Olympics, going to the Olympics. <laughs> yeah, he just needs also, more... Also, <laughs> Right. Yeah, he just needs more panel time in order to kind of get some kind of depth again, kind of, I think. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Mm. Maybe some more blood from the sky raining on him. That'd be pretty edgy. <laughs> yes. Uh. <laughs> well. <clears throat> then next, let us move on to the monster, the kaiju, the the thing. Um, horrifying. It really is horrifying. Terrifying. Like. And it's really made to just be this nightmarish thing, I feel like, with, like, all of those teeth just oh, jam-packed gosh, teeth. in its oh. huge mouth and, like, the spikes on its back and the freaky eye-looking things. It's eyeballs that aren't really eyeballs. Like, what is going on? <laughs> yeah. So, I have a wacky theory on the kaiju. Okay, please. Do tell. It's not necessarily something that I believe in. But I have to mention it because there were a couple different things that got me thinking about it. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Keiichi said that the the things that aren't eyeballs, that they looked inorganic. Mm -hmm. And that got me wondering if maybe the kaiju is some kind of man-made machine? Man, that'd be wild. Like, if those, like, for example, if those eye-looking things are like pods where like the operators are sitting <laughs> or something like in, inside of there or like, and, and, and Keiichi also said that it's like the kaiju is wearing armor. Well, maybe it is, maybe it is like a steel clad machine. Mm-hmm. And then I think the kind of fastening thing in the notes also kind of 
might make sense with this potentially in some way if it's if if somehow Yodogawa somehow was onto something about about this then it could it could could be a connection there but again i know it's pretty out there but i had to mention it yeah when they brought up the whole fastener concept and just kind of theorized about the back and and whatnot i wondered if it was something that was machine related or if it, something was fastened onto an animal of some mm. kind I did not go as far as to think it was piloted or manned by a crew. Um, <laughs> that in, is interesting. It does have uh, these animal tendencies, though. I mean, the the crying and True. the yeah. uh, going after or or taking the bait. You know, going going after Asa, uh, very animal like. So yeah. I'm not too convinced <laughs> that it's a completely man made object however i think there is something to be said about the potential of there being some sort of mechanical thing going on um mm. i still think that that could be a, considered a wild theory as well though because how how even in our day how does that how does it even happen <laughs> right yeah there is definitely that as well <laughs> and i did think about that like yeah it's totally unrealistic although so is it's, it's unrealistic to begin with you know? <laughs> you're right very much true <laughs> I I wonder what kind of uh, people would be able to do do such a thing. Yeah. Um, I I I guess it it would just seem most likely if it was, you know, nuclear based, uh just like how Godzilla was. Mm. Uh but maybe that's just too cliché and I was always trying to go for something a little bit different. Maybe I kind of hope it is way. different from that, actually. Yeah, I, in, I agree, in some actually. in some way. Mm. Maybe it's otherworldly. Maybe we're dealing with aliens, or I mean, hey, <laughs> spatial rifts, or or something. Right. I'm open to anything. I think <laughs> at this point. Yeah, I mean, that that thing is clearly not something that is found in in our world. It's, it doesn't really resemble anything. Not with all that, all those teeth and the inorganic eyes. Yeah, and, and whatnot. Yeah, so it, it it's fascinating. I don't know if we'll ever get an explanation for it exactly, because it, I almost feel like this story is more just focused on Asa's journey and and her quietly defending the world instead of unraveling the mystery of the monster. Um, I think I would be a little bit disappointed if we didn't get these mysteries answered kind of i guess i'm trying to brace myself for that <laughs> you <laughs> fair, know like <laughs> don't set my expectations too high uh-huh that's uh, probably smart <laughs> yeah because i have mm. been burned in the past mm -hmm. uh, so i don't know but i would love that oh my gosh yeah i, I would love there to be some sort of mind-blowing revelation about what this monster is all about Definitely. Uh, and I think, I, I don't think it's un unreasonable to think that along her way, like along Elsa's journey, she will uncover these mysteries. Fair. Fair. I'm going to stick to that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I hope for it too. Uh, good, good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the things about the monster is what is its goal here? What is it? What was it trying to do? Was it hungry? Was it upset right. about a noise i i don't know because despite being pretty anxious to get on the island or you know yeah to, to get on land it got hurt and then went after asa and then i guess it just went away so it's like mm. what was it trying to do and and why is it on and off i i mean i also say what does it eat <laughs> yeah you know how it <laughs> what what is going on here is i guess what i'm trying to say <laughs> <laughs> yeah lots of mysteries around the kaiju yeah i guess i don't expect you to have an answer but uh, yeah like right now i don't think there's any way for us to know really anything yeah fair enough kind of. but was that all on the monster 
Yep. So let's slide into predictions then. The Olympics will start in the next volume. Gotta. Mm-hmm. We're right there. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, maybe this is wishful thinking, and I believe you're with me at least in wishing for this. We'll we'll get more Shota content in the next volume. Oh, really? Hmm. I I I think so. I'm I'm not basing it on much other than that he appeared at the end of this volume. But <laughs> yeah, I know he's appeared at the end of other volumes or, or, or in small portions of other volumes. But yeah, yeah. I just got a feeling with this one. <laughs> hmm. I I think it depends on if we get a time skip or not. Because hmm. my prediction is that if we see the Olympics, it'll be only briefly. And we're going to go past that pretty quickly. Uh, and it, it definitely, it would just be in mentions that the Olympic is going on or something happened. Uh, I, I don't think it was going to focus too much on that and probably more so on a recap, <laughs> you know, like a, you know, Asa reporting to Jisoji and them talking and, and whatnot. That's what I think. And it, it, even if it's not a time skip, I, I still do think that they'll get past the Tokyo Olympics and just go back to preparing for whatever next big event, <laughs> uh, oh. in my opinion. What would you say, if you have one, what would you say is your main prediction in terms of a time skip? Like, what, like, like, like how soon do you expect it to come, and, and how many years do you think it'll be? Bear with me. I, I'm going to give a little <laughs> bit of exposition for this. Uh-huh. One of my predictions is that, to me, the, the book seems to be implying that three friends are going to go their separate ways. The cover of this book is ha- has them all together, you know, being friends. Mm-hmm. And then, but you also have these two pictures of both Yone and um, Miyako, like kind of in intense moments or whatnot, in key moments. Yeah. And how this book ends, it kind of sets them on potentially different paths. Yone going down the idol route, Miyako maybe becoming a wrestler, and then also just keep on doing her thing so i could see them just growing up growing attached and then we have maybe like you know two or three years where they're they graduated from high school and they are going to college or doing you know doing whatever uh their career paths would entail Mm. um i would like for them to have some sort of relationship still and I think because they are characters in the story, that they, they should have some sort of connection. But I think yeah. it's going to be Asa trying to bring them back together and, uh, you know, just keep their friendship afloat in a way. Hmm. Interesting. So that also ties into, you know, three or four years would be the next Olympics. So I wouldn't be surprised if in that time skip, is when we see Shota again, much older, well, four years older, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. uh, ready to go in the Olympics. Maybe he gets in the Olympics. Maybe. Probably to qualify, it may have to be three years. I don't remember how, how far back it, before the actual Olympics they, they get their people to qualify. Uh, oh, he yeah, would probably I have be, no idea. He would probably be qualifying in Japan. Like I'm pretty sure that's where that would take place. So maybe he would meet up with Asa there. Who knows? Uh, but that's kind of my thinking for a time skip. And in terms of how it relates to Asa, maybe it's a little too obvious if we keep going to all the Olympics and, and having the monster appear up there. Um, but I think it would be really cool if we left Japan and if she actually goes oh, yeah. to this, this island where the monster supposedly lives, where it has had those claw marks. Precisely. And uh, go study that. And I think once she's in college, that's a perfect time to go do that. For sure. Or at least graduated from high school. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely like, like like that, like for her to kind of explore the world a bit more in search of answers, kind of. That would be really awesome. I think, I, I mean, I, I, I definitely, the, the, there is a time shift coming at some point. I'm going to say that it, it won't happen in the next volume, though. Um, hmm. I like this current kind of age, and I feel like I still want to know more and see more f- 
of it. But yeah, I'm going to say next volume will stay completely at this, in, in this time, kind of. And what, I'm ex what I am especially interested in seeing is for Asa, Miyako, and Yone to meet each other again after having gone through everything that they've been through now, uh, mm -hmm. like most recently, and seeing how their dynamics and kind of relationship, right. like how, how it may have changed potentially. Mm -hmm. Especially, I think, from Yone's side, it, I, I think there's been kind of more change than from the others. Well, there has been change, I believe, in all of them. But I think yeah. Yone, she may have changed a little bit more. <laughs> that's fair. Uh, that that's also uh, something I thought of as well, um, and I and I think that kind of ties into them drifting apart, in that Yone becomes because she changes her look and her confidence, she becomes this popular girl. And oh, that way. Okay, okay. Try to distance herself from her old friends. Or at least Miyako, because Miyako will be become more of the maybe, maybe tomboy is not the right word, but she'll become more interested in martial arts and things like that. Maybe, uh, maybe. At least that's what I'm thinking. And then also would still be the the glue trying to keep them together. Yeah, I I definitely agree. Like about Yone, in one way or another, distancing herself. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's because she becomes a quote unquote popular girl, or if it's because she just wants to pursue her 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 uh, dream as an idol like kind of completely and just kind of not really have it much else uh, to distract her potentially mm -hmm. regardless uh definitely asa and miyako though i feel like i i don't think there's much of anything really in the way of them sticking together no no i i when you when i mean by glue i mean asa's the glue mm. between yone and miyako ah just specifically there okay okay gotcha gotcha yeah yeah Mm -hmm. yeah although yeah otherwise they would not they would not bother right yeah so it's going to be really interesting to see now how how this all plays out i mean maybe, maybe we were completely wrong in everything we we're saying but i think something along the lines that we've been saying makes a lot of sense for for for, for the story to kind of yeah I, mean, I could be completely wrong which i, I have been <laughs> before in many times so that that's fair it happens but I, I do think there is going to be a mix up here, and I, I feel like having the their their picture together on the front of the volume is not just in, in indicative of what the volume contains, you know, kind of their three stories, but also, you know, maybe times are changing, you know, like <laughs> the, yeah, the good old times, yeah. and then next volume maybe not not so good times. Right. I mean, they'll probably still be happy, but it's just not the same. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. In my opinion, but obviously you disagree. No, no, but I, I do agree, especially from Yone's side. Like, it's going to be very different, I think. And it may be hard for the others to kind of, I guess, adapt to that or, or kind of come to terms with that. I really think it's going to be Yone who pushes them away. Like, yeah, right. She just seems like that kind of person, unfortunately. Because she's already kind of started doing that in some yeah. ways in how mm -hmm. she's been forcefully kind of involving Asa in her shenanigans and 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 keeping secrets from from Mieko like it's already kind of been bad like that right right but yeah we we do need some some drama in this morning drama no no golden <laughs> wings golden <laughs> wings <laughs> right uh man i i love that so much I, I can't get over how much i love that it's pretty cool um, it's really cool yeah <laughs> I wanted to get your thoughts on the series as a whole. I know we don't always do these for the mm -hmm. for each volume we read in a series, uh, but I think this volume was fairly exciting. So, does it did it change your thoughts mm. about the series at all, or is it is it still the same? It remains a nine out of ten for me. It was already high. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that is really high in my yeah. in my book. <laughs> what about you? I think I put it at an eight out of ten after this one because it was really exciting i honestly it was a bit frustrating uh to read it when it would cut out of the As asa fighting the monster parts it's like well, no <laughs> yeah not right now yeah, that was frustrating <laughs> you're gonna tell me later <laughs> that, did agree. you see on the teeth um <laughs> so yeah i i think i think this volume does put it up a bit 
Uh, awesome. I, I've kind of been up and down on this series. Mm. Uh, so who knows? Maybe next volume I'll put it back down to seven, but we'll, we'll see. I, I think right <laughs> now I, I have it at an eight. Awesome. I'm glad to hear it. Then we probably said everything we needed to today. So if you enjoy our content, you can follow us on Twitter at Umami Manga, and it would be lovely if you'd like to support us by rating our show on the podcast platforms and subscribing to our channel Umami Manga on YouTube. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time when we'll talk about Volume 6. Bye-bye! See you later! You know, the boomers really like that. Ha ha ha! Hey, Poopy's pants! Oh no. <laughs>